Today we have a great chat with Amanda Waltz of Saw.com discussing how a domain acquisition works when you're not sure of what domain you want to acquire, how a broker can assist you in that process with or without a marketing agency. I hope you enjoy the show and learn a lot. FD was built by domain investors to increase your inquiries, sales, and profit. Forget spreadsheets and archived emails. Manage your entire investment portfolio in one place using a secure and completely confidential platform. Learn more at FT.com. That's E-F-T-Y. FT.com. Hey, Sherpa Network. I'm Tess Diaz, executive producer of DomainSherpa.com. And today we are joined by Amanda Waltz of Saw.com. Hi, Amanda. How you doing? Good. How are you? Oh, pretty well, thanks. Um, so you have been brokering domains for how many years? A lot. Um, I kind of lost track. I think it's 10 years this year. Oh, congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, you have been a real driving force in the um, brokerage industry, and I am really excited to have this conversation with you today. First, I know last time you were on, um, we were talking about a uh, couple dings in the messages, and I'm super excited that we have figured out what to do, and I think as a PSA for humanity, um, we should share it, because it's a pain in the neck. This whole work from home uh, yes. is an adjustment for everyone, and on top of that, I mean, we all, you shut down iMessages on your but on your computer, you mute the message, you do, do not disturb, and it still dings. And right. it's taken me this long to figure it out. So PSA for our whole Sherpa Network, what did we do? We went, <laughs> yeah. uh, I think it was in the settings on the computer, on the actual Mac rather yeah, than we went up into the, the phone. You're right, yeah. into the Apple icon on the computer. Right. Uh -huh. Then messages, yes, and preferences, then, right, general, and then play sound effects. Exactly, uh -huh. turned it off. Because most other things, <laughs> if you quit the application, it should stop. Absolutely, um, usually takes care of it. Um, and I thought, oh gosh, you know, I've done it on my phone, and we got that feedback from one of the listeners. And there's nothing—I mean, there's nothing worse, especially if you're noise sensitive. Um, I actually have a couple of people in my family who are driven to um, who knows what when noises are are really that annoying. So um, I felt for that guy for sure. Oh uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I. I I do feel for our listeners, absolutely, but also on the other end, I just feel like there are so many um, little problems that we are solving constantly. Yes, well, you solved it. Oh, <laughs> it was you. Well, Thank you. I like that we sat and tested it and <laughs> you're like, send me another text. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was good teamwork for sure. High five. All right. <laughs> So I'm really excited to talk to you today about um, the process when, um, when a client approaches a broker for an acquisition, both for, um, for folks who are listening to the show to understand what that process looks like, or also sometimes people come and listen to this just to discern if they need a broker or what value a broker adds. And I sure. think aside from you know the negotiation process and saving you time and money in the negotiations um i think what we want to focus on today is um is that different part of um the the, the entire step-by-step -step process so you said you're working on three large acquisitions right now mm -hmm. um and you don't have to share you know obviously all that sure. private yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but let's walk through. So somebody calls you, maybe they've already decided, we don't have to go through the decision-making process, right? But so let's say they're at the point, they know they want you to be their broker. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes they know what the domain is, sometimes they don't. Um, how do you start it out? And we're talking just a high-end acquisition. So, you know, probably what, six figures and up, let's say. Um, Correct. Yep. And that's what um, the three of these are right now. They're all very, very different. Um, they all came to us by way of referral. So I would say, 
honestly, 90% of our acquisition business comes from other happy customers who have utilized our services in the past. Um, you know, whether it was myself on my own or um, one of our other team members and their other companies, um, and they did a good job for that particular client. And I've had calls where people have said to me, oh, I was with so-and-so at, um, dinner the other night and we started talking about their great brand and they mentioned that um, it all came from a domain name and we want to know if you can do that same thing for us. I mean, that's like the most amazing call or email to get when somebody specifically says like we found our domain before we found, um, before we named our company. Mm -hmm. You yeah. and I both know that it certainly does not always work that way. Um, and there's sometimes that 11th hour phone call from a company saying, oh my gosh, I can't believe our digital um, agency didn't get this, um, but they recommended you and can, can you help us get this now? Um, so, you know, I would say that no two acquisitions are the same. Mm -hmm. um, I, I couldn't even begin to describe how different all of them are, especially even the three that I'm working with right now. Um, the only thing that's similar and exactly the same is that they all came from another, another customer who was happy with our services in the past. Um, so back to your question about, you know, how do we begin? Um, usually, well, not usually, I, I won't do it without having a, a telephone conversation um, with the, the potential client, just to make sure that we're all on the same page, that they understand that, um, like I just said to you before, no two are exactly the same. Um, some acquisitions can take a week, some can take a month, some can take a year. And it really needs to depend on um, a good working relationship. Um, you know, do they understand the expectations, do I understand their expectations? Are the expectations aligned? Does it make sense for us to work together? Absolutely. So, um, yeah, so, you know, I, I don't necessarily have a full on questionnaire, but I do have three main questions that I walk through, you know, with them. Um, and it's, it's, I, I think it goes back almost to consultative sales training in that, um, do you understand what your prospect needs? Do they understand what it is that you have to deliver? Um, do they understand um, time? Do they have the budget for what they're looking for? And do you have, if you have those matches, how's your rapport? You know, does this person seem like somebody that you want to work with and for? Um, and then a lot of the other details, I would say, get ironed out as you go through the process. You know, you might identify their product, service, platform, whatever it is that, that they're looking to bring to market. Every founder has a vision. Um, they may be at the very early stages of what that vision looks like. They could also be um, already started. You know, they may have a, a, a seed round. They may have, it may all be personally funded. Um, and that goes, that, that also plays into um, budget timeframe and, and what their threshold is. Um, I don't, I don't necessarily even love it when somebody comes to me and says, I know exactly what the domain is that I want. And um, I know I have a budget for it. Um, because it doesn't always work out that that is what the domain ends up being um, hmm. at the end when the brand is rolled out. So having somebody as a founder or as the chief legal or marketing or whomever within the organization, having them um, have flexibility and understand that just because they have a seven figure budget um, doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to get their top choice of a domain name. Very true. So, so it sounds like most people come to you without knowing exactly what domain do they, that they want. Do they present a short list to you or um, how do you move from saying, I don't know what I want to the next stage? Yeah. Um, oftentimes they will say, you know, we like brand names like this we have a vision for our, our company we know um you know we know how we're going to market our product or service whether it's you know 
direct to consumer or business to business or business to consumer through some sort of channel, they, they already have that business plan pretty strategically mapped out at that point. Um, and then, you know, through a series of questions, we can typically figure out, um, you know, what resonates with them. Is their target audience female? Is their target audience male? Um, and, you know, try and guide them in that direction. Like this particular word is a little bit more masculine than this. Is that the direction that you're thinking? And, you know, oftentimes in that conversation, they'll say, oh yeah, you know what, that's, you're right. Like that's, that's the avenue that we should be going. Sometimes they already know that. Sometimes they, they don't know that. Um, it really depends. Um, I'm seeing a lot more companies that are willing to think a little bit more outside the box um, as far as um, let's say we have a, a client that's looking in a particular industry, um, a furniture industry, for example, and they understand that their target market may be starting out in the United States, but perhaps they want to expand globally and they understand that a, a, a very large percentage of the United States is now Spanish speaking. Maybe we should start to look in um, Spanish language domains um, and they can make that transition very easily and quickly um, looking at data points and having our team suggest data points to them that backs up their theory. Okay. And um, um, what about like a, a branding agency? Are they usually, is it broker or branding agency? Is it in conjunction? What, what do you see there? Um, I think it depends on the client. I think it also depends on the relationship. Um, the, the customers that I have um, personally, I've worked with them time and time again um, in, in different areas of their lives. So if they started out in a, a large, um, let's say Fortune 500 or 100 and they were marketing, um, or their company was purchased by one of those Fortune um, 500 companies. And so I've sort of gone the life cycle with them. Um, sometimes they engage an agency very early on. Sometimes they engage an M&A firm very early on. Um, and I'll work with them as they're, I don't, as they're developing the concept and as they're working with their own internal team to talk about shares and, and whatnot. That some, some of these founders bring me in at that stage. Okay. And we, we talk about options and all, all of that at that stage. Um, I have worked with agencies, um, digital agencies. There's a couple in New York that I like to work with a lot. Um, and it's really developed over time because in the beginning, um, when I was first introduced to them, they didn't want to work with us. They- I, Not you personally, but I think um, a lot of branding agencies really miss the boat on the domain aspect. Completely. Um, yeah. Or and they've got it. Like they think they've totally got it. They are, um, there was, there's one in particular that I work with a lot now that in the beginning they were like, um, yeah, no, we know the dot com's not available. Um, we'll just do an IO. Yeah. And, and I was like, oh gosh, yes, you certainly could go in that direction. Um, however, I don't suggest it. And here's why, you know, your client and my client have brought us together today so that we can try and work through this really quickly and make sure that we have alternatives in the dot com. Um, should we not be able to get the first choice, we're not going to immediately pivot to a dot IO. Like that's why we're all here today to talk about this. You're a great collaborator. Yeah. Um, so, um, so whether you're working with the branding agency or not, you're definitely contributing on that end. You hear, um, and I, I've, you know, it's, it's definitely done the same and seen the same over at Media Options doing brokerage there. Um, so you kind of present this short list as you work together on ideas um, and what their concepts are, what they want to connote. Um, what if they had any budget in the world, they would want uh, just to, to help say, okay, if, if this is what you would get, if every domain in the world was available, that helps us know which direction to take. And Sorry. then how do you start pricing that out or knowing 
what, um, what their actual options are, what's on the market. Yeah. So I work with a lot of different um, other brokers and also with um, owners, portfolio owners, to be able to know what they have um, available. And usually I'll go to some of the, the larger um, owners and say, okay, I have a client that has a budget of 200 to 600 for the right domain. They'll, you know, they'll go to 600 for the pie in the sky, like their absolute ultimate. Um, and this is the type of service that they're looking to roll out. Um, what do you have that you think could fit into this? And then um, I just keep good records of, um, you know, what they've given to me. And then sometimes I'll go back and say, um, oh, you know, they, most, most of the time they want to know like, okay, they send me a list of 30. What, what do I think that my client is going to like off of that? And I'll pick out usually three or four and say, um, you know, this is what I'm putting on my short list. This is what I'm recommending that they continue to look at. And the rest, I don't really think are going to be a fit for them. But um, is it okay for me to keep them on a list and check back with you and, you know, next month, I, I will most likely have a different client who will have similar requests, would that be okay? And, you know, nine times out of 10, the seller will say yes, because ultimately, that's what they want to have happen. They want their domain, um, their investment asset to turn into a household brand um, and, and have the company that is using it, um, use it in a way that if they were going to use it themselves, they would have done so. That's, that's neat to see that side of it. Um, yeah. And you know, there's no MLS in the domain industry or anything like that. So relationships and record keeping are very important. Sounds like you do a great job at that. Um, and those private there's, portfolio <laughs> owners are important. Yeah, there's definitely been times. Um, I mean, I see this all the time. It's in, I say to buyers, this is a very fluid list. Like what you see today does not mean that it is going to be available tomorrow. There's a, a list um, that I'm working with right now with a company and we've been working on it for about six weeks and they zeroed in on something last week that I said to them, you know, this is out of your budget at this point, but I want to put it here in case your board decides that you can stretch for that. And it just happens to be uh, a media options um, domain. And lo and behold, it's not available anymore. Oh. So, um, it, yeah, I mean, it's fine. It, it, I think it actually shows legitimacy to what um, the domain industry has to offer. It, it really... It, if I say to a potential buyer, um, this is a really great option for you, but it's also going to be a really great option for many other companies because it is so generic and it's such, um, such, such a positive connotation for any industry, like you should really think long and hard about this one. And the fact that it was under agreement shows that, um, it, yeah, sure. it, yeah. exactly exactly yeah. oh interesting yeah um so you so you kind of curate a list for your client based on their needs for um and then present it back to them with a with price range right and then what's the process usually or what are some interesting or typical situations that you think um someone listening to this show should know for the process of working with their board, deciding which domains to pursue, how many per domains do you pursue just one at a time? Um, yeah, it's interesting. I've found very recently a lot of these clients um, will want to take it to their trademark council. So whether that includes a, a GC that is in a, a, an already established company will typically have multiple layers. You know, they will have their general counsel, they'll have their outside trademark counsel, they may even have um, another layer. And, and to make sure that both sides understands what's happening. So the domain sellers that I have, and let's say I have a, a short list of five, I'll then go back to those sellers and say, okay guys, um, your name is on a short list of five, 
here's what's happening. They like them all. They're doing internal focus groups, but they are also checking trademark. Okay. And even though a domain is a generic term, if a customer wants to use it in a particular vertical market, um, I do think that they should absolutely go through that process of making sure in that vertical market, whether it happens to be, um, you know, food service or the furniture market or financial services, whatever it is, you want to make darn sure before you start negotiating um, that you've already crossed your T's and dotted your I's and made sure that um, somebody who knows what they're talking about legally has signed off and said, yes, you can use that um, with a fair amount of um, not being bothered by anybody else in that vertical market. Um, this was the part I, I think that is the most challenging um, for folks who are not familiar with the domain acquisition process. And I think something that the um, that brokers add tremendous value at this point, um, because I don't know about you, how many times would you say that you have to tell the client, hey, this is the time. I think the timing of when to involve counsel is vital, um, because if you involve them too soon, you're especially if you're a smaller startup. Um, you know, who doesn't have someone in house, you're consuming a lot of billable hours, but you don't want to involve them too late where you delay a potential sale or um, throw off a, a seller and they're, you don't want to, um, it's almost like doing the home inspection at the wrong time of the purchase right. process. Right. Like yeah, that's a good analogy. Offers and other, you know, an all cash offer here and a, you right. know, quick close there. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is the moment once you have a short list to present back is when you say, all right, take this to your counsel. Yeah. Most of the time. I mean, there's one client that I'm working with right now that still has a very, um, I mean, we have a short list of about 10 domains. Um, but their trademark counsel has literally looked through about 150 names, um, at the onset. Um, and, you know, I said to my client, um, this is surprising to me that you're going through this process with this entire list um, because it's pretty gigantic. But um, she felt really confident, you know, this isn't her first rodeo. She's done this a couple of other times, um, that this is how she wanted to proceed because this is how she had done so previously. So, I mean, there's, there's also that trust, right? It, it's... Um, that fine line that you walk. Um, you know, this may not be the quickest process, but this is the process that my client is telling me that they've followed and it's tried and true for them and they're not gonna deviate from it. So, you know, if you have that type of personality where you need things to happen like boom, 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 and all of a sudden your client's bringing you in a different direction as a broker, I think sometimes you just need to sit back and, and trust like, hey, this is, going to work out. It worked out previously and it may not work out for me personally as the broker right now because I, I would like them to make a different decision in a different timeline. But really at the end of the day, if you're good at your job um, and if you can sit back and know how to follow the cues of your client, those are the clients that I think continue to refer you because you're not putting that tremendous amount of pressure on them and you're being honest and transparent and voicing your opinion like, hey, I would really hate to see you spend $800 an hour um, going through all of these domains. Um, but if that's, if that's your choice and that's what your team is telling you that they want you to do and you, you've done it in the past, who am I to say, you know, yeah. who am I to continue to insert myself when it's, when it's really not it's not my lane. I'm not like, I'm not ready to negotiate yet because they haven't made a choice. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, yeah. I think that is very consultative, like you said, and then they do what they need to do. So they come back from the trademark attorneys mm -hmm. with a shorter list of at least what they would be allowed to pursue. Right. Um, and then um, 
but that's not necessarily, I mean, I assume first they would narrow down like, hey, we don't like these couple. We're not going to pay the attorney. Right. To propose. Yeah, exactly. Um, get them off the list and then go, you have to go back to the sellers and just say like, hey, you know what? I made this recommendation two weeks ago. You had two that were still left on the list. Um, they don't like any of them anymore. I'm really sorry. It stinks. I thought it would be great for them, but um, it, it's not going to work out. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it's not me, it's you. Um, <laughs> right. so, it's a great domain, just not for this client. I mean, yeah. Um, so then um, you have the short list. And how do you decide um, wh wh what to pursue, which to make? Um, do you make offers on all of them, but non? No, no. Yeah, no. Yeah, that to no. that to me would be like, um, I think that would could get pretty ugly pretty quickly. Um, you know, maybe it works for some, and you know, they just put out like blanket offers and and see what comes back. Um, I have a pretty good sense. In my, in my opinion, I don't know why I asked if you do that because I wanted you to be more, you know, no, I, I think in my opinion and experience, that's a sign of not a great broker that, mm -hmm. um, I mean, you should be able to prioritize your list and make offers that are actually meaningful because you'll never keep clients coming back. Oh no, that would burn um, like the biggest, like, <laughs> grenades going yeah. off at yeah. that point. Um, no, I mean, I, I think I have a pretty good sense of knowing either I've sold domains for this particular group or, or Jeff or Brooke or Rob, whomever. Um, so I know, or just looking at the charts, like I know that so-and-so sold a very similar domain for 400000 So then I'll take that information to my client and say, you know, a year ago, a very similar domain from this particular ownership group sold at this price point. I think, based on my conversations with them, you could get this domain in a similar range, and here's where I think you should start your offer. Okay. So we right. go through those five and say, okay, this is where, this is how I think it should go. And then some clients, I've had a client that um, did a focus group and took all, um, it wasn't five, it was three, out to a focus group and um, talked about their product, their service, and then essentially said, like, these are our names, choose one. Um, and the one that we thought was going to come out right on top did not, um, based upon the, the focus group and the audience, and it was their exact market demographic, and um, it went in a different way. So huh. sometimes you, even the most, um, you know, sharp marketing executives that think that they know um, what, what's going to resonate with their audience does not. Interesting, yeah, um, and that's a great tool to use. Otherwise, I think a lot of times too, there's this like homework back and forth where the trademark attorneys give the shortlist, then you kind of try to price out the shortlist of give them expectations and ranges, then send it back to the founder who has someone else they're consulting with, whether it's other folks on their board, um, whether it's their mentors, a focus group, a branding agency, whatever, but then they seek some support to um, prioritize that list based on the prices and the versus desire. And then they give it back to you with a one, two, three, four. Yeah. Um, and usually at that point, I will say like, okay, give me your absolute drop dead budget on each of these. And then I'm going to come back to you and make even a further recommendation as far as strategy goes. Um, and usually if it's another broker that's representing that particular asset, um, I feel like I have a good enough relationship to be able to figure out like, okay, if our top budget is $400,000, um, do, does the broker really think that this is attainable in that price range. And if they say no, then adios, like that one needs, needs to go because um, you're just wasting time 
at that point if the seller is really not going to accept what the top budget is um, even though we've all already talked about it before I mean you know things are so fluid they change very quickly um, you just want to make sure that you're creating the best buying environment at this point for your customer yeah, yeah. Um, and then, you know, if you have the good buying signals and the other broker or the owner of the domain is like, yeah, you know what, if it was an all cash offer and they could close really quickly, um, I would let it go for that price or absolutely not. Like I get inquiries on this name all day long, every day, and I just don't need the cash right now. And that's cool too. You just, you, you just know like, okay, this isn't going to happen. Or I think there's a very good chance this is going to happen. Okay. All right. So um, what further in the process then do we need to know? Uh, next, it's just you start making the offers and you have to decide which ones you want to wait on or further negotiate versus which you just want to move yeah. to the next domain on the list. Yeah, I mean, at this point, you've got a pretty short list typically, um, usually, you know, three to five domains, I would say. Um, and I usually um, have them stack ranked at this point. like if this, then that, like, if you can't get this, what's, what's your plan B? Um, and usually at this point, you figure out pretty quickly um, who's a motivated seller. Um, and if you start making offers and things are going back and forth pretty quickly, um, this is when your buyer really needs to make a decision. Mm -hmm. And at this stage, this is usually the only time that um, I get more, um, I don't want to say aggressive. I actually don't like that word. Um, but this is when I get more serious and say, okay, this domain does get a lot of interest. It could lend itself to many other industries. If you really want this one, like, let's not mess around. I don't want you to think that you're going to get this. And then in the end have, I don't know, $30,000 stand in your way because you didn't, didn't make a decision quick enough. Yeah. I think, Amanda, you are not ever aggressive. I think uh, I, I literally went to thesaurus.com for this because I was like <laughs> on the tip of my tongue. Um, I think you are assertive and, but I think the best word is emphatic. Um, I think you know when to underline or highlight something. Um, and that's really, really important to know, just like you were saying earlier, to know when to let things go and when to say, hey, pay attention, this is important. Um, so. I'm gonna use that with, um, with my husband and my kids when they tell <laughs> me that I'm at that point where they're like, back off, I'm gonna say, no, I'm sorry, but I am really assertive, not aggressive. <laughs> And then you take out your awesome glasses. <laughs> oh, the glasses, yeah. Um, I actually, I'm gonna, you'll laugh at this. Um, they hid them somewhere on me because when I came into my office today and they knew that I was getting back on this call, they hid them. I think they were afraid that I was gonna wear them. So mean. <laughs> so Amanda has these super edgy, really cool Velma glasses as yes. her children call them. <laughs> And they would rather her be blind. She's mm -hmm. seen four of me right now <laughs> in, in uh, sacrifice for her high school and middle schoolers to uh, still, because, yeah. because all the teenagers are watching Domain Sherpa. I know. That's what I said. I, my daughter says, she goes, I don't know, mom. Maybe somebody else's kids are going to be like watching it with them. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> you never know. Hilarious. Um, well, um, yeah. So where were we? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I can't see you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we were at almost like go time. Like we're we're in the thick of it with the negotiations, and um, this is where I think you know sometimes the the founders of the company, you know, they're not they're not losing sleep over this because they know that they have a plan B and a plan C if all mm. else fails. Um, but this is where I think they start to get a little bit more assertive too. Um, you know, Hey, I want an answer back. Hey, we need to name this company, Amanda, like, let's go. Cause you're so, so close. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yep. Um, and I'm sure they have a queue of things waiting for once they have the name. Oh, 
yeah, yeah, yeah. So. I mean, they've they've got creative waiting. They've got legal waiting because they have these documents that need a name of the entity. There's, you know, all of these, um, all of these things that are not my specialty. Um, but I think, you know, I think what I hear from a lot of clients is that the reason that they work with a broker, whether it's us or another broker, is because we take that tedious aspect of the research, the negotiation off of their plate so they can focus on all these other pieces that need to come together before launch. Yeah, yeah, um, makes sense. So um, I think that was a good start to finish of the process. Are there any interesting um, stories or um, gotchas or anything you want to share? Any little anecdotes or uh, tips you think we missed or you think we covered it? Um, I'm sure there's something that somebody will say that we missed. Um, that, I mean, that's really our process. Um, you know, there's I guess one key takeaway that we probably did miss is if there isn't a budget for the particular um, service or platform, if there isn't, if you, if all the stars don't align, right? So let's say they have um, champagne taste, but um, beer um, money for, for this particular project or service. Um, we'll still find them something. I mean, we'll absolutely find them something. We never say, we never say no. Um, I've worked with clients that have bought um, very small budget domains to start out, and then we've upgraded them later. Um, I've worked with clients that are self-funded, that know how important a domain name is to them, and have their budget built way ahead of time. Um, but I think that our team personally, and I think uh, there's lots of other teams out there that do this too, just because they don't have a six figure budget or even you know a, a five figure budget, my referrals are like gold to me, and you never know who's on the other line like you really don't you can do tons of research on LinkedIn, you can do all of that, but um you really don't know always um, who's going to be the next whomever, you know, whoever your favorite um, famous founder is, you don't know that the person that you're talking to on the phone isn't going to be that next person that, um, who knows, like comes up with a vaccine for COVID. You, you have no idea. Yeah, you're right. No, you're right. We, and there are some we, really unusual ideas and out of the box thinkers. Do you think, you know, I feel like the domain industry is made up of a lot of quirky personalities because people need to be out of the box thinkers to get involved in the domain industry. It's not something you can take a class on, get a degree in. Um, it's, you know, a newer asset. I love how Drew Rosner always says he's like, there's no other asset has appreciated over the last 20 years, like as much as domains have. Um, and yet so few people know about them. Or, uh, or intimately understand them, which you would think there'd be some motivation. But anyway, um, um, I feel like startups and founders um, more is in, the, um, uh, in that arena than in the Fortune uh, 100, 500, whatever's who are just developing a new product or service. Um, I feel like those folks are a little more creative and quirky too, in a different way. Um, does that affect your engagement with them or your approach? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think you approach every situation a little bit differently. Um, you learn how to engage with different customers in different ways. Um, yeah, I a hundred percent agree with where I think you're going with this. Um, some of the Fortune 500s, um, the executives or the marketing folks or the legal folks there um, have a very, they have a very one-sided um, view of how this gets done. And if you're working with a founder um, and let's say their investor, um, who maybe have done this a couple of times before already, um, they have a very different and unique 
way of approaching this and are more willing to listen to the way that, that I'm suggesting that we approach this than some of the others. You know, I've, I've worked with companies that will come to me and they'll say, I know exactly how much we need to pay for this domain. We've already carved out a budget and that's all we have. Okay. And um, you would think that they would have a lot more money to spend on something like this based on their um, on their earnings calls. I guess we'll, we'll say that. Um, just a little bit more rigid in their approach. Um, to domain acquisition. Okay, interesting. Yeah, yeah, um, very cool. Uh, so with these three acquisitions, uh, I wish you well. Um, I hope that some of them we could hear about on a future Sherpa. And, I hope so too, because uh, <laughs> they're so exciting. That's really cool, yeah. And yeah. Uh, if not, I'm sure we'll have something else to talk about. Uh, but more than that, I hope you find your glasses. <laughs> Me too, for sure. <laughs> well, thank you for taking the time after. Thank you. I know yesterday was a rainy day in Boston. Did you have hail, did you say? We did. We had hail. Um, it didn't last long, but um, the wind that came with it um, made, well, internet with two homeschoolers and um, my husband that runs Zoom calls all day long. Um, it makes the bandwidth here a little spotty when the wind starts to blow like that for whatever reason. I bet. Well, I think the wind and hail was just the collective crying of all of Boston over Gronk. <laughs> I agree. I'm still not over it. I, I can't remember if I was talking to you about it. I actually said to my husband a few weeks ago, could this really ever happen. He's like, you're dreaming. And my son, who is such a Pats fan, he's like, mom, he plays for the W. He's a personality for the WWE. That's never going to happen. And literally yesterday, school canceled for the rest of the year and Gronk follows Tom. Unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Big, big change. I actually think it's going to be, I mean, I talk about great negotiations. I think uh, I mean, there's that legacy, that, you know, heartbreak, but also who, I mean, Tampa's going to sell out. They're going to do. I know it's going to be, and you know what? The yeah. only silver lining in this is that my parents live in Tampa. And um, so I can, you know, have a reason to cheat a little bit. Right. Oh, that's cute. I like that it's cheating to you. Um, I wouldn't ever even consider, even if my parents did live in Tampa, but no judgment. But I, also, I mean, the Pats getting a fourth round draft pick. I mean, I, they're smart. They got to rebuild. Um, yeah, I hope they be. use it wisely. Yeah. Well, I think they use everything else wisely. So yeah, I'm still heartbroken, but I will get over it. We all are. But yeah, yeah. So on that sad note. <laughs> yes. Keep watching the birds in Boston and uh, we'll, we'll see you next time. Okay. Sounds great. Thank you so much. Thanks, Amanda. Bye. Bye.